Um, okay, hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, in uh, Paida, in Estonia here, and Dimitri, can you hear us? No? One, two, three. Hello, this is Estonia calling. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can establish a connection. Oh, okay, well, we can see you. Good morning. Can you hear us? Very quietly. Very quietly, okay. Can we do I something? I see you fine, but I think I can't really hear you. Okay. And that's a nice setting, though. <laughs> I, was, I say I can barely understand what you say. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can speak up a bit or if it's some microphone adjustments you can make at um Okay, we will try and make some I microphone. See myself on the screen, though. We can uh, Wait, try and make some okay, microphone fine. adjustments. Yes, everybody wave to Dimitri. Sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm just checking how leg is. Wait, okay. If I do this. So. Yeah, we're talking like one second. Okay. Uh, That's why you can sing a song together over Zoom. Is it um, is it better now? Have have we done something? Can you hear us now? Uh, very quietly. Really. Oh, again, very quietly. Okay. Hmm. We are working on it. Something. I mean, I was speaking to Andres before, and that was fine. Okay. So it's not uh, it's not you, it's us. Andres, are we doing no, something? Was, or? His mic was fine, so maybe you can sw switch. <laughs> or do something else. Okay. One, two, three, four. Maybe mm -hmm. if you... Still if you quiet. If you can hear me, Dimitri, we can start with... Uh, mm, I can, but it's just so low. I can turn off my fan because I'm in Greece right now and the, because the fan is making more noise than you. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe we can start. Can you just... Uh, Dimitri, can you introduce yourself to the audience uh, sure. shortly? Who are you and what, is, uh, you know, what are you doing in Ukraine? With the, uh, with the internet? What is your role? Sure, I'll explain. Well, um, right now I'm in the European Union. I'm working from EU, but most uh, uh, of things I'm doing are related to my company, Postmaster. We are the main registry for Ukrainian top level domain. So, oops. Okay, while we are waiting, I'm turning to the audience. I would like to know if you are all Estonian speaking or if there is anybody who doesn't understand Estonian, please raise your hand. So we, okay, you know, okay. So we just know we uh, announced this discussion in English. So I was wondering if it's only Estonians, we will uh, later switch to Estonian, but then it's English all the way. Until I see you leave. <laughs> when, when you stand up and leave, we will immediately switch to Estonian. <laughs> no pressure, I hope. No, no pressure. <laughs> we, we are happy to speak in English also. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, uh, so, um, until we get... Oh, did we get you? Dimitri, did we... Are you back? Okay, we can't hear you. Um, I will just <laughs> try and introduce the, uh, the setting and the topping, uh, uh, topic. So uh, the war in Ukraine has been going on for quite a long time for now. And um, to this day, the in internet connection is still functioning. We see video clips emerging uh, you know, from, from Kiev. We, we see Zelensky's addresses to the public, interviews uh, to world media. Um, we see uh, video clips on Twitter and Telegram about you know, how, how the uh, Ukrainian soldiers are blowing up Russian tanks and so forth. So, Internet is functioning, and our goal today is to try and find out how much is it functioning, how are they keeping it up, um, what are the lessons learned from this cyber war-like thing? Um, are the uh, Russians trying to destroy internet connections? Are they trying to uh, 
um, to reroute internet um, to uh, and connect it to the Russian internet. Uh, what has Ukraine done to keep the connections up? What is uh, you know what is their experience? How important it is? Um, know, how does it help uh, to get the message out and and so on and so on and and what can Estonia do to uh, you know to um, to learn our lessons from from all this? So we have here uh, Merle Maigre from the e-governance uh, academy. Good morning. And uh, Tenu Dammer from uh, CERT Estonia, the uh, Chief uh, Cyber Warfare Officer. Thank you. Good morning. Okay. And uh, Dmitry is actually a uh, uh, Ukrainian. He's a co-founder of the Ukrainian company Hostmaster. And he has uh, played uh, quite an important role in, uh, in keeping these internet connections up and, and keeping the country connected um, to the internet. So Dmitry, are you back now? Can you hear us or can we hear you? Okay, we can. So I think what we'll do is uh, we will continue this discussion here, and when Dimitri is back, uh, just maybe the tent will let us know, and uh, then we uh, will uh, will turn to him. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe I should ask Tenu, uh, you uh, have you how closely have you been watching these developments in Ukraine, especially uh, concerning the internet connections and the and the and the cyber warfare? Are you familiar with this? S sadly or, or unfortunately, uh, it uh, doesn't only affect Ukraine. What our common eastern neighbor is doing, it, it, it also affects us as uh, recently as uh, this week when uh, there was another uh, BGP hijack that rerouted some of the internet traffic uh, through Russia. Hmm. So, uh, so this is uh, th this is something that Ukrainian colleagues have uh, announced publicly uh, several times. This has been witnessed several times um, that uh, that um, Russians are using all means and methodologies that are in their toolbox, so to speak. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so we are we are aware. We have been learning from them. We have been uh, learning from previous uh, experiences. And, and what we try to do every day is to make ourselves a little bit more resistant and resilient to, uh, to these kinds of uh, events so that uh, we would be a more of a nuisance. Better. Yeah, good morning from my side and uh, really uh, glad to be part of this uh, very important discussion. My own interaction with Ukraine started uh, 17 years ago when I moved to Kiev to work as the deputy head of NATO liaison office there. So I've been um, in touch with the uh, security developments in, in Ukraine ever since and today um, uh, uh, when working at the E-Governance Academy, uh, we work very closely with Ukraine. We actually have a 20-member team in Ukraine, um, back active as of uh, yesterday, uh, also physically in our Ki Kiev downtown office. They, were, they have been active all throughout this uh, wartime but uh, working from homes. So, um, yes, I mean, while I have enormous amount of respect what you do, Tuno, and, and it's clear that you are very much in touch with the latest uh, details uh, and, and developments. Putting it more generally, I would say that the Russian invasion to Ukraine has really put to test our understanding of what role cyber attacks do play in, um, in a conventional war. While uh, we were prepared for something far more serious, in the West, yet the fact that Russia um, did not play it out as we were expecting doesn't mean that cyber attacks uh, do not play a role in this war. Russia has invested a lot of resources into the uh, potency uh, and sophistication of its uh, cyber weapons, and it is playing it out in Ukraine very curiously. Now, I admit my, un my knowledge of it is coming from second-hand sources while Tenu, Tenu has the privilege of, of seeing, seeing uh, things on beneath the uh, sort of water lines as well. But my, my, uh, my, my understanding of it is based on various conversations, on the Twitter exchange, on reports that have been put out by Microsoft 
um, both in April and uh, uh, and in June that add really uh, granularity to understanding of it. And what we are seeing really is that um, Russian cyber capacity is certainly not tapped out. And uh, this is something that is, uh, uh, they, uh, r cyber attacks are uh, are targeting Ukraine, Ukraine. They have been doing it shortly before the active uh, war, so to say, that started in, in, uh, in February. And uh, they are targeting uh, also allies helping Ukraine, including the Baltic states. So what what is it that we were expecting? You said that it didn't play out exactly like we were expecting. I, I was expecting, you know, having read and heard about the Russian capacity, you know, to take down power stations and, you know, hack anybody and everybody around the world. I was expecting the kind of, you know, a nuclear option in cyber. I, I thought, you know, they would just erase Ukrainian Ukra Ukraine from the internet and just, you know, close down pretty much all important Ukrainian computers. Uh, maybe that was too much, but what were you expecting? Well, when reading experts, um, there was a lot of doom and gloom and dystopia painted uh, throughout, uh, based on what Russia has been doing in Ukraine exactly uh, before. I mean, ultimately, uh, we were not that wrong to, to paint that dark picture because uh, Kremlin did attack the uh, Ukrainian uh, election systems back in 2014. Russia did attack the Ukrainian uh, electric power plant systems um, mm, in December 2015, to 2016, leaving um, thousands of people in cold and dark in the middle of the winter. Uh, so these attacks have been happening. However, I think what we are seeing is this more subtlety and nuanced way of how cyber warfare is, uh, is playing out aside with conventional warfare. So cyber war is not something, a, a thing in its own, sort of like some sort of uh, this powerful um, nuclear um, disrupting, uh, smashing, smashing the systems. At some points, it is more effective to shell um, a data center mm -hmm. than to hack it. Although hackings have been happening as well, and we are learning a, uh, a lot about it, or at least the public is learning about it a bit with a time uh, lapse. So uh, details come out and they are published a little later. Where, uh, so, I mean, some um, on the day of the Russian invasion, for example, a hack did, uh, 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 did occur against Viasat, uh, which is a provider of high-speed satellite broadband, and, and against one of its satellites, the KSAT, um, and we have the Ukrainian police, the armed forces, and the intelligence as users of KSAT. So, in a short answer, uh, what I think could, what role does cyber cyber attacks play in a, in, a, in a in a military warfare is first intelligence gathering, second attacks at times of of. Uh, of military activity, primarily against the command and control and the communication systems, and then thirdly, these general mm, cyber operations aimed at uh, disrupting or, or deceiving the public. On the third category, I think the Ukrainians themselves have been very, uh, very effective in controlling the information space uh, in a much more powerful way than anybody has expected. Mm -hmm. I would, um, <coughs> I would agree that. Uh, that uh, the doom and gloom that was uh, sort of portrayed in respect to the capabilities that Russians have, the, the Viasat uh, case is, is one example of fairly significant collateral damage because it didn't uh, only touch Ukraine, it touched uh, most of Europe, mm -hmm. including us. Uh, and if you look at uh, another recent uh, incident uh, concerning Freeport uh, gas export station in US, where they ship some 25% of uh, liquid uh, gas around the world, they had an uh, incident, and they are uh, suspecting that, that uh, Russia was also behind that to put more scrutiny towards Europe. But at the same time, it also it is evident that Russia started this uh, active uh, phase with a different um, understanding of the situation. That means that they probably did not foresee uh, the need to include cyber 
that much into they the thought news. it's going to be over in three days right exactly yes. and then then they put out the news uh, uh briefly uh already uh, on on day two how uh, how kiev has been uh, captured and 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 all that so so they started with with different premise and they didn't really have a good coordination of these capabilities and then then what sort of strategic input it could play out so so in that sense we have been lucky uh, but to say that, that there is no need to uh, concern, uh, that is also true. Um, what is of positive is that uh, Ukraine has managed to keep things going, and it only shows that, that when you do put uh, sufficient uh, resources and, and, and uh, efforts into keeping things functional, you can do a pretty good job in making the life of an opposer bloody difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dimitri, uh, are we? Are you here with us now? Can we hear? Can you hear yeah, us? Yeah, I'm now? listening all the time. I'm oh, that's very good. Perfect. So, let me ask I can you. Make some comments. On yes, both, please. Uh, yes. Your people's. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, the NATO person. I forgot to. Uh, I forgot her name. I'm sorry, but I do agree with that assessment. Uh, what she mentioned, uh, the one that works with NATO forces. Uh, that uh, well okay there is most of the targeting cyber control and just want to make something clear we are not an isp right so we just in a way we are a user of the internet as much as any ukrainian company or organization is but what we did found though about a week before the war and in fact i had made a presentation about it which you can find uh, okay i think you can just google my name and um, it's called probably ua infrastructure uh, we had experienced a denial of service attacks on our own infrastructure about a week before the war. It was, if I'm not mistaken, 14th uh, of February or 15th. I know it was Wednesday. Yeah, it was a day after the Valentine's Day, 15th, correct. And so a lot of these attacks, in my opinion, were, although massive, they were not really skilled, right? Because I explained the denial of service attack is just when you put bunch of traffic on some system and hope it would collapse. It doesn't always happen. We switched to Cloudflare worldwide protection and it just mitigated that threat. And we keep using that. And we had weekly monitoring of that by the statistics and basically just going goes down significantly. But many ISPs in Ukraine has been fixing physical infrastructure, right? So the first point of attack was actually physical infrastructure. When you have some bombing or some um, other impact, you just disconnect the wires or mobile networks. And I know that there was recent report on her son network done by Kentic, and actually there was an article in New York Times about that. And I know people from Kentic, Duke Majority especially, uh, they, Russians, I mean, occupation forces, they tried to turn off mobile networks, mobile network towers, and they went to ISPs in occupied territory of your son city and told them to reroute their connections from Ukrainian ISPs to Russian controlled ISP in Crimea. There is a specific one, and that was done well back in the beginning of the war. And there was actually, like I said, there's a recent article about it. Our own infrastructure was mostly in Kiev, it was also partially abroad. We haven't got any physical attacks on infrastructure, although we had turned off some servers out of precaution in the cities which were under threat of occupation. But that threat did not materialize. And we had also stopped in those cities, which was also moved. So I think actually your first threat and your first defense should be physical people and computers and links. So there was not as much as cyber attacks I can talk about. That, of course, you have to have your basic internet security. And that actually doesn't really difference. There is no much difference between current state and, say, state a year ago. It's not that attacks did not happen before. They intensified. Uh, Dimitri, we were talking here that we expected this um, conflict to play out differently in in the cyber range maybe we expected that the russians would do more or more seriously or more effectively you know they would just disrupt ukrainian internet much more 
did you also expect this that they would do more or or not no no with every day i think russians are stupider and weaker than they are pretending not to sound just like as a typical ukrainian internet patriot who i am of course i just say that time have proved that the pyramid command and control structure of russian government and russian population is unsuitable for the modern society and explain what it means as far as i know russian internet is well okay it's large but the state there controls much of the mm, wings they have this company called Roscom. yeah i forgot to tell her I, i know somebody from russia who is actually now in exile in lithuania his name is klimarov he is writing about that partially in his uh, blog and he was monitoring that and there are other research about um, ukrainian connectivity basically ukrainian network providers are a mesh um, the network of networks so i don't know how much it is in estonia but i spent some time in lithuania recently and in other countries of europe right now i'm in greece and i noticed your typical setup in a eu country is you have two or three big players let's say i don't know it's tele in lithuania and maybe mobile connectivity providers sometimes they're both and there may be a dozen or so of smaller companies and that in ukraine we're talking about the hundreds of isps each of them is connected to some other connections each of those is connected to different international links so it's not like say all of ukraine internet is through poland or through i don't know <laughs> slovakia right or germany well we do have direct connections but every isp is in ukraine is trying their best to connect to other ukrainian companies to international links and sometimes they were even connected to russia i'm talking about the past about last 10 years and yes we always had good internet connectivity to russia but not because we needed russia links but just because a lot of russian isps were also well connected to the to the west that means that your typical internet connectivity in ukraine is not just one or two links you may have three or four and then you have more further so there's a lot of resiliency there right now i think most of ukrainian providers are not connecting to russia but even recently i was checking that they still sometimes maintain some what they call neutral exchanges like for example they've been connected even to russian internet exchanges you may say it is bad well it can be bad but at the same time you can provide redundancy the funny thing is that the internet is not designed for partitioning is designed for interconnectivity so the more links you have physical or logical the more reliable you are and unlike say i don't know china which has a total traffic inspection russia doesn't employ that although they were trying to do this so ukraine doesn't do that either and i think we are far away from state control of internet and state regulation of internet that means that providers optimize for quality they don't try just to do things by the book uh, and speaking of the main name system by the way which i'm related to i would add that russia russian government tried to implement their own local domain name system which means they try to control the name resolution that paradoxically makes them more vulnerable because every isp using the same system means that they have a single point of failure uh we in hostmaster try to distribute our servers as global as possible and employ partners around the world so they can give us the redundancy we need that also relates to our own infrastructure dmitry so basically um... it's just too much too much <laughs> too much to break and it's not all in one place Dmitry, uh, currently in Ukraine, are there any cities or any larger areas that have been totally disconnected from the internet that are like black holes that we don't, we have no idea what's going on? Is it Mariupol? Is it Kherson? Is it some other place? Yes. Yes. Well, you made it right. I'm not maintaining the full list, but I say uh, again, uh, there are, actually Twitter is an excellent source for this. There are several companies that maintain connectivity and i'm not doing this day to day but well you can say her son is not disconnected because they connected through russian controlled isps in crimea but 
say in Melitopol or Mariupol or in other areas of um, south of Zaporizhia, Zaporizhia or in areas of Donetsk and Lugansk. Of course, if there is fighting going on in some specific city or territory, well, they may just have no internet and it's something that happens. But I think mostly, paradoxically enough, even if Russia occupies some territories, they try to control the narrative, therefore they try to control uh, the internet connectivity there. They mean that they try to reconnect them somehow. For example, connecting to the mobile networks and distributing their own SIM cards. I know about some specific cases. I just don't want to mention them because it's too small. But so, so if if I'm somebody there living is no in Russian internet yet, okay, and uh, yeah, explain. There is no Russian internet yet. There is common internet. So somebody who is in Russia is still connected to the internet. Somebody who is in occupied territory which is served by Russia-controlled ISPs can still be connected to the internet, although they do try to filter things like what? Facebook and Twitter. I actually don't know what Russia is controlling. Thanks God, I haven't been to Russia for years and I don't know exactly, but I know they have extensive blacklist of sites. They try to block Telegram. I think Twitter and Facebook is banned. I'm not quite sure. Uh, so if I am uh, somebody, just a regular citizen, uh, living in Kherson, for example, um, is my mobile phone dead? Do, how, how, the, how does it work for me? Is my mobile phone yeah, showing who... nothing, my laptop, my Wi-Fi, my, I don't know, DSL connection at home? You ask, you ask him their own person, but I know that, okay, I do have, I know some people who know people who are in Kherson. And they've been disconnected for a while, but now they are connected. But what does it mean? Some ISPs in their small function. Um, like I'm already mentioned Kentic Analytics, they made an article and I can probably share it later with you all. Uh, if you go for Twitter, Kentic is the company name, it's K-E-N-T-I-K. Uh, they maintain, um, they did recently research on internet connectivity. They're one of qualified companies that watch all these links there's a lot of data being buzzed but basically internet traffic in her son went to zero and then went up but it's not as high as it was before that probably means that some of our sps are not connected somebody said had a home connection and they're out right but they may have mobile network if they don't have local um, service uh, from the mobile operator, because that operator is disconnected, they may got Russian provided uh, mobile operators, and I know nothing about that, because well, I'm not in occupied territories, but basically, it's in my imagination partially hijacked infrastructure, and that may or may not work. So I guess I would say reduced connectivity, spotty connectivity, filtered connectivity, but things like Signal Messenger or Telegram usually work. You may find yourself not being able to use the web, but then you can use VPN and most VPNs can go around Russian blocking. You know, it's probably better to find somebody who is living there and talk to them. Um, Actually, that can be a good idea to research that. And I think Ukraine government should actually step up their efforts to help people who live in there to stay connected. They do have some data there, but okay. I mean, there's just so much work to do. Okay. And by um, the way, I think the government is doing an excellent digital education job. They just kind of do it that fast. Our uh, co-panelist, uh, our co-panelist Merle has uh, a question for you. So Merle, please. Sure. Oh, actually, sorry, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to kind of building on what uh, Dmitri said. I wanted to say that um, regarding the connectivity, uh, one lesson from looking at it from afar um, that seems to be f could be drawn from uh, from the war in Ukraine appears to be the importance of preparing against a military invasion by having the ability to move 
the government systems, critical government uh, data assets and digital operations, if need be, across the border. Um, Estonia has been thinking about it a while ago with our data embassies and with what happened in Ukraine, especially in late February, early March, this proves the point. And this is connected to what you are asking while, of course, you um, are, uh, we're referring to the um, everyday individual level of people's ability to stay connected to the internet. I think it's important to sort of also talk about this um, moving the government systems because Russia clearly, not surprisingly, attacked some of the physical servers uh, by conventional weapons. Therefore, uh, Ukraine's ability to move its government systems into various public clouds with the great help also, and this I think is, the, is an important second lesson of this war, uh, the, with the help of the private sector uh, and allies. But private sector has really proved um, indispensable. Microsoft, um, Google, various uh, threat intelligence companies, they have done an incredible job in helping Ukraine to move, uh, move itself to cloud the well, Ukrainian you're government. Right. You're right, but Ukrainian is using Amazon exclusively. Just so you know, cloud-wise. Ukrainian uh, biggest uh, bank, uh, private bank, uh, which is now government owned, also moved its entire infra to Amazon. If I'm not mistaken, they did it in about a month. And that's actually a big feat. It's a bank that I would say, I haven't ever met a person who doesn't have a private bank account. And it's like, I don't know, it's like the Skype of, of the banking. You know, I mean, if you know what I mean, right? Skype was the first person, the person connectivity tool that I'm still using, by the way, made in Estonia, somebody in, and some people don't know, and originally made. And um, what I mean is, yes, you are very correct. And maybe I should, let you finish but point is you should not do it after the war like if i'll be estonian ministry i'll do it right now Dmitry. just because it's a good insurance <laughs> Dmitry, i i i have a i have a very uh, simple question from your point of view how much uh, does your daily operation depend on uh uh, foreign companies uh, uh, helping you uh, to carry the, the, the burden that uh, is entrusted to you? Mm. Oh, well, it depends a lot, but it also depends on domestic companies. I mean, I explained back in, in the days when we started, we tried to do things as much as we can on our own. That means that we owned our hardware. We run it in our office on in several what's called data center locations. That's basically a place where you rent a shelf and you put your computer there. Okay. Nowadays, we're still doing that. We still own a lot of infrastructure we have, but we also have partners which we work with. And these are all European companies plus, uh, uh, well, we work with Amazon in Europe as well. And we also work with Cloudflare, uh, but they're American company, but okay, they're global operating. So yes, it depends on them. And I think you cannot now run anything online on your own. I mean, you can build your own data center, but we can't afford that. You cannot make your own hardware and you cannot write your own operating system, right? In the end, if you run Linux, you are dependent on volunteers and companies that support Linux. If you use any software like Nginx web server, which is, by the way, was originally developed in Russia, something that we use, or use the domain name servers, or we use any other code, you are depending. So nothing is now made on your own. And clouds, I'm actually very suspicious of clouds. I think clouds are bad for companies like ours because we are an infrastructure company. We are something that should not go down when the cloud goes down. So you can use things that are scalable but at the same time, you should have your own capacity that does not depend on anything else. How you balance that, that's a trick that your CTO, your CIO, or somebody else in your company should do. So you divide your systems into groups and decide which group, which is the best way to implement it. And going back to Estonia, I don't know how much electronic Estonia is, but it does help, I think, in a country perspective, to have a lot of things that your customers, I mean, your citizens, your residents can do that 
they can do online. And like I said, I would like to applaud Ukrainian government efforts that started, actually started mostly during Zelensky administration, uh, to move things online, to make services to be working online. Ukraine has like electronic passport application called DIA. The Ukrainian has well, COVID certificate that maybe it was a regional driver. They have a lot of other things like renewing your driver's license uh, or stuff like that. And you cannot move things online if you don't have things online. Right. So again, I'm not going to tell Estonians what to do. I think Estonia was one of these small countries that did a lot of things online citizens and that's kind of a bigger thing once you move things online there is no going back and then you must make this infrastructure as reliant and something that is isn't reliant as resilient and as distributed as you can so you cannot just move it abroad you should have it in multiplayer places cloud is one way to achieve these multiplayer places but cloud doesn't guarantee that because you still need single source of data somewhere. Uh, so if you have it in a single place in cloud, then you have just made the new vulnerable place. You made you must have backups, redundant systems and all that. As so. uh, Dimitri uh, pointed out, um, you know, Ukraine is a big country, both physically and also the number of ISPs and, you know, companies connecting to the internet is is much larger than in Estonia. And I, I think it's true when I say that when we uh, build IT infrastructure in Estonia, we probably haven't thought much about physical security. You know, what if a warplane uh, flies over that and drops a bomb, right? You know, will it still work? Um, have we thought about, maybe, Tenu, probably it's secret, but I think we are not very well physically protected from, from bombs flying, or, or, or are we? Well, if you uh, have followed the news, uh, it, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that Estonia is looking for uh, uh, mid-range uh, air defense systems to prevent these sort of scenarios uh, taking place. But uh, it is also true that uh, Ukraine and the experience they are going through uh, helps us to learn many different aspects of uh of where the risks lie and when uh i think mitri said uh, very well before uh, and then also merla that uh, that when we thought russians were gonna ha uh, attack us digitally then when you have the data center in front of you you can just bomb it mm -hmm. so so uh in both ways you 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 achieve something it might be a little bit different on what you achieve but, uh, but the physical aspect cannot be uh, ignored. One example again, um, if you look at uh, some of the recently occupied territories and when they have transitioned the internet connecting to, to Ukraine, they are now going through Russia. How was this achieved in, in basically in, in two days? I can imagine only <clears throat> very few scenarios how this can be done. And uh, it means that, that uh, you needed a person to give you an uh, admin level access so that you can physically uh, change the configuration of, of, of routers. Now, you can do this multiple ways. And one way I can imagine is with a gun behind your head. So again, you well, don't need to do it this. It was actually reported in New York Times. It was exactly that. And it was not connection from Russia. It was connecting from the Russian occupied territory of Ukraine. So you have to bring the fiber link to Kherson. Then they go with the gun to every ISP and force the operator to change the connectivity. That's how it works. And then this is this is something that I think that's we actually have... I know somebody who knows firsthand that. I mean, I know somebody who knows ISP in her son who has experienced that. And the article in New York Times that was published recently has described exactly that scenario in in detail. But but my point was that, you, that you know this this was something that we had perhaps not considered too relevant to consider people the few people who have access keeping them out of harm's way suddenly becomes as e important as implementing all your digital security measures maybe keep keeping them out of the country right so that might be one thing okay uh, and maybe we can devise a more intelligent system that you know in case of uh, war it becomes impossible to change any configurations in routers. <laughs> All things could be uh, imagined. 
how many yes. how many i would be glad to come to estonia and advise you to harden your register and i'm not joking i cannot say i would do it in one day but i would be glad to do assessment of your security as much as you would allow me i mean and i'm not the only one person who can do that but basically i think actually of making like a lecture out of my experience mostly for operators similar to us and what tools we use and what lessons we have learned and i'm not guaranteeing it would work for you right it's just my own experience i'm not a professor of security at all but yes also you how many should consider uh... various scenarios like what you would do if half of your staff dies choose random half of your staff pretend they're dead and see if your company can function mm -hmm. Probably not. Or maybe that is a bad word. Let's say, okay, not connected to the internet, right? Let's use that word, black hole. That may be the better thing. And actually, that's a pretty possible scenario. If people at home, if something starts and then you have no internet at where they are, well, that's what you have. So Dimitri, you have how is, uh, Dimitri, how is Ukraine uh, connected, uh, Ukraine's internet connected physically? to the outside world you mentioned some cables run to russia but probably lots of uh, them uh, also to other neighboring countries right or is it uh, well most cables are not running to russia most links in internet are fiber that's been going through 90s mm -hmm. mostly surface links uh, to to western countries mostly it's links to well poland i guess uh I'm not sure if there's any uh, subsea cables going from Odessa to the south, but I would not be surprised if they are. Uh, we don't use much of the satellites. And I used to work for ISP, but I'm talking about 90s. I'm not sure how things are. Most of Ukrainian domestic connectivity is by fiber as well. And if you have seen those photos when people are repairing, they're using fiber splicers to reconnect the links. Mm. So, oh, and we have Starlink. Even if you have mobile tower, the mobile tower is just like a home Wi-Fi router. It has radio link to your equipment, and then it has uplink, well, uplink because it's connecting to the internet by fiber to the main infrastructure of the operator network. Yeah. So Russia just took place where people had fiber links as well. I'm not actually sure that works now. I was talking about, let's say, events like a decade ago. So, but Estonia uh, has a uh, few cables running. Like, you know, to... people in Donetsk has been connected to Russia, for example. It doesn't mean that there were ISPs using. When you have a link somewhere, it just means that you can send data to that link to specific addresses on the other side of that link. Mm -hmm. So, say somebody sitting in Kiev and looking at the website located in Russia would still maybe go into some links to Russia, while these links can be going from say Germany, you can have, for example, Russian SP present in Germany through Cogent, and they can be connected to you using the same Cogent. Cogent is one of the big operators. So there are a few cables that there. are running uh, from Estonia to Finland, and then there are there is something running from Estonia to Sweden. Am I correct? So far, not. Oh, okay. But so, you are forgetting the cables that uh, connect us um, over eastern border to Russia. Mm -hmm. And you're forgetting the cables that connect uh, us to uh, over a southern border to Latvia. Okay. So all in all, we have the number of connections, physical connections going out of Estonia probably can be counted on one hand's fingers, right? It's like four or five. More? More. Okay. Um, are we thinking about the physical security of these cables? Because we know that the, probably it's Russian submarines that have been very much interested in, in cables all around the world. And, you know, they are not tourists. Um, if you recall, I said, you know, we have basically cables going north, east, south and west. Then, uh, of course, we are worried about the sea cables but we also have land cables. And in this regard, uh, we are not alone. Uh, we can go to internet through the land cable uh, in Latvia, and from there, we can go through Latvia, Lithuania, and to internet from there, we can go through Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, uh, and from the internet there. So there is a, there are multiple ways how we can actually send our bits and bytes uh, towards the, the internet. The first thing Russia them. does is attack Suvalkin. They cut off Lithuania and then there you go. 
and then, then in this way, you know, uh, you can look at the whole Baltics as one. So to to say that uh, that uh, one Baltic state is uh, in that sense independent, uh, I would say that that here we are in the same boat. Okay, Mela, do you have a comment to make about anything we have been talking about uh, so far? Yeah, Dmitry mentioned the Starlink. I think that that that's relevant, and and it yet again I think underlines the importance of uh, of, of I mean the braveness and the capacity, the high capacity of the Ukrainians, but also the uh, capacity of the Ukrainians to work together and to absorb uh, the support that both the allied countries as well as the private sector has shared with them. And um, just kind of like zooming in into a, a moment where I think like. Uh, for me, a takeaway from the first days of war, uh, where where the internet connectivity uh, resonated strongly, was the f was was I think one of the first days of the war when President Zelensky was offered to leave the country and he ra he preferred to stay and there was lots of confusion because Kiev was shelled and uh, and everybody tried to understand what is really going on, and Zelensky came online filming himself or, or by his being filmed by his team or something. The fact that he had, he and his team had uh, connectivity, they were able to prove that they are in Ukraine, reassure the country. I think it is an important aspect in uh, uh, and a takeaway for any conflict. Um, and I'm putting it into the Estonian context of this importance of the leaders to be, um, to have the connectivity and to have the, um, mm, braveness and capacity to link up and communicate uh, with the people, with the world, is very important. And here this uh, strategic communication uh, is, is uh, very, very impressive, something that the Ukrainians have been m keeping up and, and really um, in command of uh, very swiftly throughout this wartime. Yeah, and also, especially during the first weeks and probably even first months of the war, the, uh, the fact that we could get these video clips from the war zone, you know, from actual battles, you know, from Ukrainian soldiers running and blowing up tanks and, you know, winning it, it really helped, I think it really helped shift the mood in the West that, you know, these people are actually capable of defending themselves, therefore, you know, there is a point for us to send them aid and send them money. And, and it, it really sort of lifted the mood. But behind all that, there had to be connections, you know, in the field. Somebody was, you know, had to be able to take the phone and send the video clip to Twitter or to, to anywhere. Um, from having a cable that can simply transport bits and bytes is not only uh, itself sufficient. There are some uh, underlying, uh, a little bit higher level services that you also need. DNS, domain names, resolution. You also need the accurate time for the encryption to work. So, so having simply the cables is just one aspect. But we also need to think about something else where we can say, OK, I have a cable. I want to send this to Twitter. What is the IP address that I'm going to send this packet to? And how am I going to encrypt this? So this is, uh, this is something that I think often is, is, is forgotten. And uh, and it's important to understand that not only the cables we should look at, but everything that we need to actually make the communication work. Cable is just one part, very significant part, but not alone. All right, um, we have a wonderful audience here sitting in the shade. If maybe any of you have a question to uh, to any of the panelists, feel free. Uh, feel free. Um, if you feel more comfortable asking in Estonian, I can translate, no problem. Just raise your hand and we have a question. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I'm Christian and uh, um, I have a question about the, um, so sort of um, downgrading uh, technology in Ukraine that I've read about. Uh, for example, um, uh, during the first uh, days of the war, uh, I read that a lot of uh, ISPs and uh, cellular uh, operators have been uh, closing their 4G networks uh, due to lack of uh, uh, main backbones and, uh, and have uh, switched uh, cellular towers to satellite uplink 
be that Starlink or, or any other provider. Uh, and um, and uh, therefore increasing the cell size in two, uh, 2G or 3G connectivity to reach the as, as far as possible and, and uh, make the connectivity happen and also uh, the, the most uh, uh, import, uh, interesting aspect uh, technology-wise uh, during the war was that uh, many countries in the West have uh, turned on their shortwave and, uh, and longwave radio transmitters to uh, bring news and uh, other war-related uh, information to the general public in, in Ukraine. Uh, BBC World Service, for example, I know they, they closed their uh, transmitter towers some 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, and um, can anyone comment on that? Ha ha has there been any any help with that? And 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 any 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 comments uh, on that? Thank you. So anybody? Um, well, I would first assume Dmitri would say, but uh, but uh, it is uh, technically something that uh, can be done in Estonia. It has been done for a slightly different reason uh, on uh, our northern coast. Uh, some of the uh, mobile stations on 2G are built in the way that, that they typically uh, reach further onto the sea uh, for specific purposes. So technically it can be done if you have the need. And, and, and I would assume that... Uh, uh, such a need would uh, would arise in in case of conflict. Uh, again, a need that has arisen in the conflict is uh, national roaming. Uh, typically, this doesn't take place anywhere uh, for commercial reasons. But this is in in Ukraine. This is not the normal uh, normal times. So this is also something that, that we are looking in Estonia, uh, how to make sure that, that when there is a need, there is a magic switch. So again, not, not, to, not to use outside of, of, of normal time when it doesn't make sense, but if there is a need, there are some tools that, that can be uh, configured or scenarios that have been thought and then prepared. Yeah, and also uh, the whole informing the public uh, side of the question has been sometimes discussed in Estonia, but then we discover that, oh, you know, lots of people do not have, uh, you know, FM, AM radios anymore. So in case of, you know, uh, maybe the networks are down, we can't call them, we can't send them an SMS. How, how do we inform them about what's going on in, in, in the country? So that's a good question. I don't know, Dimitri, do I want to add here or, or not? Actually, it means something. Uh, well, actually, a very good question. I'm not a ham radio operator, but I know some people who are hams. I think it would be a very good idea to keep the radio network functioning. Unfortunately, I mean, the TV went digital, the radio went silent. I do listen to some <laughs> radio still when I'm in Ukraine, but uh, I don't think that there were any foreign radio transmitters uh, located uh, in Ukraine that can be activated or I guess near the borders can be, but well, it's a large country. As far as Estonia can do something, I guess it's too late to give people radios. Plus, remember, they think that one way, right? I mean, the mobile phone is two way and it's more useful. What I think is good is to keep your 2G network because 2G network is more resilient. And it can be used for text messages, and it's nice, primitive, but very reliable functionality. The national roaming is an excellent idea. I think uh, for those who don't understand what it is, it means that if you have, let's say, three or four national mobile operator, and you have out of you are out of reach of one, well, you can switch to other. And that's what's going on in Ukraine since the beginning of the war. Every mobile operator has agreed to freely serve customers of every other mobile operator. So people who are out of connectivity can use the other. That actually was immensely helping people in occupied territories, say near Mariupol, because, well, let's say you have only key start connectivity, you can use it regardless of what operator you have. I also knew that Russians were trying to shock and kill people who are trying to go up the trees because that's how you can reach the signal better. 
unfortunately. And um, yeah, that was absolute reports of that. So I guess um, actually 4G is working fine as well. One practical step you can do in Estonia is to consider, if not already, to license lower frequencies for 4G that increases the, the distance. Uh, it also decreases the bandwidth, but it allows you to serve population with less towers. That means that, you know, you can have functioning mobile service even if your nearest uh, tower is not working. Okay. Uh, so 3G but... network is kind of the worst. Thank you. Not um... really reliable and... Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, back to the audience. Do we see any more hands? Any more questions, please? No. Somebody was moving their hand, but that was unintentional, I think. Um, so there is another side to this that I would like to discuss. We have maybe half an hour left. Um, we remember that when the war started, then um, both Ukrainian hackers and the Western hackers they sort of united, and the goal was to cyber attack Russia to maybe take down, there were attempts to take down Russian TV stations or to, to hack them and broadcast the truth in Russia to Russian people. Um, there were uh, reports that somebody reported that they had hacked the uh, guide, guidance systems of Russian satellites and that the Russian sat Russians are not able to operate their satellites anymore. Um, there was this whole, uh, the hacker group uh, Anonymous sort of came together and it was hacking for freedom and, and you know, what the hashtags were. Um, th th but that really went nowhere. And it kind of surprised me. Um, and I want to know why. Is, is the Russian, you know, did the West just tire of this? Or, or is the Russian society protected really, really well? All the Russian ministries, agencies, all the TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, Nothing came of it. Why? Meda, <laughs> you can start. <laughs> well, I can share my personal thoughts on this. Um, uh, so I think the uh, Ukrainian uh, call for all uh, volunteers to unite and hack for Ukraine for, uh, for, uh, campaign was valid and uh, to be applauded what regards the Ukrainian citizens. In that sense, uh, we do something like that in Estonia with the uh, Cyber Defense Unit of the Defense League, uh, where we call upon uh, volunteers to volunteer their time in peacetime to uh, just as as they do in the Defense League proper, um, hackers uh, uh, to join the Cyber Defense League Unit to contribute their skills uh, for the um, for the protection of the country. So as, as far as Ukrainians uh, themselves concerned, I think that was really great. Where things get a little bit more fuzzy is uh, foreign nationals uh, joining for this hacking campaign. And there was actually um, a lot of uneasiness from the part of foreign governments of having, and private companies for that matter, for having their people hack for Ukraine because at the end of the day you don't know where that leads. It can have escalatory uh, effects. A company whose, uh, whose people um, uh, do that is a question of like um, the use of company um, uh, mm, uh, equipment for cause that uh, is not entirely clear where it leads and whether that can lash back at countries or, or organizations in ways that the leaders of these organizations uh, would not like to have. If you ask if Russia has gotten its cybersecurity right, then you are absolutely wrong. Uh, Russia I has been focusing as a country on, on the attack and then not so much on a defense. And this is uh, well proven by, by the different hacks you mentioned. There were some successful attempts. But at the same time, these hackings depend on really who you're hacking and how much opportunity are they giving. If you are using all the best security uh, recommendations, it is very difficult to hack you. Not impossible, but very time consuming and difficult. And that is again where we have to come back to 
what are we trying to achieve? And this is always, you know, what you as a, as a whatever, a normal person or an entrepreneur or a government should ask. And the goal, as far as I understand, has been to share the information honestly about what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, yes, you can do this through hacking. It requires uh, skills, requires a lot of time. Or you can put your people who have skills into different uh, Russian-speaking forums, etc., etc., to spread the news. And maybe this way you are a little bit more efficient than through employing these skills at, you know, hardcore hacking. Um, another aspect that I uh, just recalled, which is uh, goes a little bit beyond uh, the Ukrainian call uh, for uh, volunteer hacking, but uh, was was curious, was this. Um, uh, conflict that that ran through that throughout this uh, war that the uh, conflict that ran through the criminal groups that are based in Russia like Conti for example that usually uh, do not um, publicly announce uh, allegiance to any governments they are just criminal hacker groups whereas with the outbreak of of uh, this phase of the war some groups like Conti publicly announced that they are loyal to Russia and that created cleavages within their uh, criminal groups. There mm -hmm. were some um, patriotic Ukrainians who actually then went out and leaked information about that criminal group, which was curious um, development in this uh, criminal cyber hack world. But also I think in this uh, you know, hack for Ukraine or hack Russia uh, case, there could have been maybe a language problem because a lot of hacking is done not by brute force hacking but by phishing or even you know spreading the truth it has to be done in in russian right and you know whereas we could gather american british whatever german hackers through this anonymous maybe malaysian hackers i don't know um very few of them speak russian and are able to craft you know russian messages russian phishing emails that <coughs> look authentic and the other way around, I think many, many, many more Russians speak English or are able to do this in English, therefore are able to fish and hack us rather than uh, you know, us hack them. There is one aspect that uh, from our point of view we, we tend to forget. Uh, Merla has uh, a laptop right next to her. Uh, we have quite a few uh, IT technology around here. Do you think this is uh, the same in Russia? People might have their cell phones, but when you look at the typical uh, high-level IT in different uh, Russian uh, organizations, imagine a manufacturing uh, plant, I would bet that most of the technology still comes from our you know, previous uh, generation and and uh, political uh, establishment that has very limited connectivity to 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 modern technology so this makes uh, these things a little bit more difficult uh, but what you say about the language and all that that is absolutely true um, for I think this is a benefit uh, towards uh, Ukrainian side there population in general can speak Russian better than we can. Yes, and it actually, in case of conflict, it might be uh, a problem for us. Because I think, you know, we have seen Russians, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Ukrainians intercepting Russian soldiers' phone calls. You know, maybe even communicating with Russian soldiers, giving them false information, false orders, you know, all these kinds of hacking can be done. And it's probably much more efficient to do it in Ukraine, where uh, you know people speak Russian much more than in Estonian. So you're saying let's la learn languages, so we, learn, we learn can Russian, so you can uh, you know tell Russian soldiers where to go, <laughs> and just direct them into the wrong place. But if you if you really want to be a hacker, you should not learn Russian. You should learn Python and 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 all the programming languages and 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 the technical specification on on how different standards work. <laughs> okay, um, we have about 20, maybe 15 minutes left. I'm looking at, at the audience to have more questions for us. If not, we will continue. Okay, I I'm think it's better not to learn Russian, but for you to use Estonian more. I guess Estonia doesn't have this problem like 
half people don't know Estonian really well, right? I mean, I think there is only two or three places in Estonia where people are majority Russian speaking, am I right? Yes. But it's just, uh, okay, I should check. But I was saying that <laughs> language-wise, um, I saw a lot of uptake of Ukrainian communication. Let's say in my team, we traditionally had a lot of Russian communication inside. Yes, I'm ish- I should probably be ashamed of it, but I'm not because it's just a fact of life. Well, I guess it depends how old are the people. But let's say last couple of years when I go out to the cafe, especially after the COVID pandemic was kind of under control and, you know, we start going on again after lockdowns. I noticed a lot of people in Ukraine switch to Ukrainian. The unique thing about Ukrainians that speak Russian is that they usually make it fun and kind of use Ukrainian idioms in it. So they kind of create a Creole language, which has, you know, a mix of two. Well, there is one called Surjik, it's more like a Argo, I guess. There is proper linguistic term. So, yeah, knowing language is important, but I think knowing your own language and using that is right. And I guess so few Russians know Estonians. Estonian, they would uh, really be helpless if you think about that. So focus on your own security, not on uh, them <laughs> being able to understand them. Um, Okay. Uh, and um, yeah. All right. Just to try and uh, try and recap this this discussion here, I'm asking Merle and Tono. So, can we point to any concrete lessons that that we have learned from this conflict so far, and and we come together and say in Estonia we should do this definitely, or we shouldn't do this, Merle? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because I think it's very important that we don't get lost in this forest and and can uh, in in between all these trees and we can see the forest uh, as as a whole. Yes, I think a um, couple of lessons definitely. One thing that was mentioned, I think, is this uh, uh, that we touched in the first part of our discussion is this capacity, if need be, perhaps prior to the conflict, think of how and and. Uh, how we uh, how to move uh, to cloud if need be with uh, state systems uh, or or abroad. Uh, secondly, I think what is important after all this is a war and peace um, stage here. Uh, intelligence sharing, I think, uh, a major lesson of from Ukraine is the importance of intelligence sharing between allies. Usually, especially on cyber warfare, intelligence is kept very tight. However, here in, in the case of the Ukrainian war, more generally, um, there's been an amazing um, sharing of intelligence. NATO has demonstrated to be a really good platform of it. I think it's been the um, head of the US Cyber Command, General Nakasone, who said that in his 35 years of career, he's never seen as much uh, intelligence sharing as in case of Ukraine. Then. Uh, uh, what's been mentioned, but uh, amazing industry support to Ukraine. And uh, so Microsoft, Symantec, Mandiant, Cisco, uh, you name it. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, uh, <laughs> but not, but uh, a lot among the others. And the question here is as well, how do we sort of uh, put that into procedure? How, what lessons are drawn by NATO, by the West, uh, about this, but Western government, about this public-private partnership, especially at times of conflict, especially when we know that um, Microsoft perhaps has much more in information about what goes on than the government. How do we make it a two-way street that they share and they get um, back something in return as well? Uh, then I think um, a lesson is that uh, offensive cyber operations are a fact. We shouldn't hide away from that. And last but not least, I think the importance of uh, building strategic cyber capacities of various partners. Ukraine has been a pa- case in point, but I think it underlines the importance to work with um, countries in Western Balkans, to work with uh, countries in the Caucasus, Georgia, Moldova, to make sure that their cyber capacities are stronger because at the end of the day, uh, we are in this all together. So I have uh, two or maybe two and a half points. First, I will leverage a bit what Merle said about um, having uh, this information sharing with, with, with different partners and, uh, and cooperation. This doesn't work when I send an email. This requires that I know the person. 
meaning I will go meet with a lot of people, have lots of beer, and then I can give them a call. I'm in a need. Can you help me? So, so, so this the the, the trust in 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 that sense. You know, if I'm sharing something that I think is of value, uh, that requires a lot of trust. It requires a lot of trust building. Secondly, um, when we look at uh, where Russia has been successful, and we look at the underlying causes for their success, sorry to say, is the lack of implementation of available technical standards on Ukrainian side, looking at the Ukrainian conflict. Standards are there, but have been implemented uh, partially or very poorly. Usually, looking from now our experience, why this is like it is, it is the lack of understanding of these different standards and uh, possibilities by different IT people. Meaning, we need to do a lot more education towards these people on what is, what are the risks, what are the means to counter those risks, and why they should do it, and not be afraid of you know m even making mistakes because ultimately they are trying to avoid a bigger damage. And I think this was my two or two and a half. Can you just give a short example uh, about the standards you're saying? Like, is, is this changing a password every three days, or is it configuring routers, or what do you mean? Well. I, I, I started uh, this panel saying that you know Russia hijacked uh, internet traffic, and this has happened many times in Ukraine. Uh, we did a risk assessment in uh, spring 2020. Estonia was about 25% of IP addresses were protected against hijack. Today we are almost at 90. We were actually around 80 in less than a year. Uh, so this is one thing. Technology is there it can significantly reduce the impact of such attempts. Meaning that, can we absolutely prevent it? No. But we can, with each implementation of these standards, we can make it so much more difficult to achieve the goal. Take another step. Yeah, you hijack the traffic. But when you make sure that, that by no means this traffic cannot be plain text, it has to be encrypted, then what's the point of hijacking? You can't see into this, which is typically what they're uh, trying to, uh, why they're trying to do this. So, so these things are important, and, and implementing systematically best practice is absolutely vital. So, Dmitry, we have been going over lessons learned. Uh, what are your lessons learned from this conflict so far? All right. Um, hmm. Good question. I think, uh, actually, I would probably echo some of that which was just recently said that we have to establish personal connections. I'd probably say that, well, okay, it starts with connections in your own team, right? And it's also with your critical suppliers or partners, but also with the people in the government, maybe you just personal support network, right? <laughs> your psychologist, maybe. Uh, you are going to do a lot of things if something like that happens in a short time. And I was, I remember I was really exhausted. My girlfriend joking, oh, you lost a lot of weight. I say, yeah, I guess I was not eating enough right, and drinking too much coffee. Well, okay, stress is bad and stress kills. And so um, I think uh, the lesson is actually making enough time to rest and doing a lot of work in a balance as much as you can. And uh, also we're using Signal as one of the way to keep, I mean, one of the messengers to keep your team on. I think using instant messaging versus email is very good. Doesn't mean you should not use email, but it means that you kind of rely on all people to be in the same messaging app. And that includes your external connections. I know a lot of people use Slack and you can probably choose the tools you want to use, but establishing your emergency communication mechanisms and establishing your personal connections and kind of keeping in touch with them is very important. Being prepared is important. You cannot be too prepared. I would also say you have to be redundant as a unit, like, you know, having second internet connectivity at your house is good. Having dual mobile phones is good. Power banks and stuff. Your second laptop, maybe. Encryption. 
So kind of have to think of yourself as a soldier, right? Who is going to be in a situation where you have to rely on yourself. So that also means other members of your team. So equipping them and being ready is good. Um, also, there was this article I read recently, I forgot what it was. I think it's called Drowning Rat Research. They said that they did this experiment. I know scientists are brutal. So they tried to see how much time rats can stay in water till they drown. And it took them like maximum 30 minutes to, to die. Um, so basically, you know, they can really swim and they just try to keep afloat. Then they saved some of these rats just before they were about to die. And then they put them back into the water. So they say that these rats have been rescued. Uh, they kept in the water for like 60 hours. So meaning that if you know that there is hope, your spirit goes up and you can live for much longer. So having your spirits up and knowing there is hope is very important. It's probably most important than everything else in your life. To know that you are going to go through this and uh, being able to push you to the limit and help others is what makes human society function. Okay, thank you. Um, just to end, um, I think before Russia attacked Ukraine in February this year, there were lots of, you know, this science fiction-y type of discussions about how the war of the 21st century would look like. And there have, you know, lots of smart people were saying, you know, there is no use for infantry, it's all cyber, it's all like satellites and, you know, flying back and forth drones. And yet we see that it's boots, uh, uh, boots on the ground yet again, right? And, and it's artillery, maybe in some cases, literally from the Second World War, I don't know, but it's, it's very much the Second World War tactics that's, that's happening in eastern parts of Ukraine. Uh, Merle, I guess this is more a question to you. Were we wrong? Is, is war on the in the tw 21st century still the good old, bad old, terrible old infantry war? I think cyber is part of the conventional warfare, and we should underline that. But the conventional warfare has not disappeared. And I agree with you that especially some of the images from the very beginning of, of this uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine was very, very much evoked the Second World War images, people taking evacuation in the subway lines, people cramming the uh, trains, trying to, the women and children cramming the trains, trying to escape or the tanks moving around. So there is that dimension. And, uh, but fortunately um, enough um, Estonia here uh, with NATO allies has reacted to that and uh, we do not have any pink um, glasses uh, or illusionary illusionary images but we, uh, we, we we know about this and it's also important not to prepare for the last war but for the next war so some of the uh, some of the aspects of this war for example the fact that the war plans of Russia were published in the Washington Post six months beforehand are probably unique and we shouldn't expect that to happen next time around. So we should have the prudence to be able to differentiate between um, the lessons drawn and, and uh, new things can, that can hit us. It's not easy, uh, but we have to try. But do you think that uh, uh, in the next war, wherever it might be, a larger war, you know, maybe it's, it happens in Asia, maybe it happens in Europe, do you think that this science fiction-y 21st century war, w w will it happen? Will, will we see it or will it still be men fighting men physically? I think it's, um, it's a bit dangerous to think of cyber conflicts as some sort of like enormous Armageddon where cyber destroys the whole world. I think what we are seeing rather is uh, cyber attacks uh, being accompanying uh, conventional crisis or cyber attacks targeting our critical infrastructure um, or used uh, to fish out money um, or undermine cyber, uh, disinformation campaigns uh, used to undermine the societies. This is still ongoing, but, uh, but it is ongoing along with all other various tools of influence, along with also conventional warfare. So it's um, varied 
um, and 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 uh, diverse uh, aspects of conflict. Cyber is not the only one, and cyber Armageddon has the danger of taking our attention away from what uh, Dono warned us earlier, that we have to do this routine sort of uh, cyber hygiene at individual level, regular updates uh, at organizational level, and, and taking care of our critical infrastructure at state level. Dono. We did not have time to uh, discuss uh, the cases where cyber and, 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 and physical events in Ukraine uh, coincided, in quotes, coincided. But imagine Estonian uh, Defence Force using uh, electric vehicles only. There is a countrywide uh, fast charging system. And at the need, those charging stations are simply DDoSed. So you cannot connect back to, to base stations saying, yeah, with this card you can charge it and then bill mm -hmm. it to Defence Force. So I wouldn't say it's, it's far-fetched. Maybe we are at the stage of technology where we have been thinking a little bit ahead, but I think this time is coming. Okay, so we will end with this. Thank you, uh, Merle. Thank you, Danu. And Dimitri, thank you very much. Um, I wish you uh, safe, uh, safe travels where you, wherever you might be. And let's all hope this um, madness ends sooner rather than later. Thank you also to the audience. Thank you for questions. A question? <laughs> and um, I wish you a nice day here in uh, Paida. Thanks. Thank you.